Um, welcome everybody to a uh, special program, our, our non-invasive species spotlight. Um, my name is Jeff O'Handley. I'm the program director and we are recording today's presentation and it will be available later on. Um, just as, as, as we get started, we ask to mute yourself, uh, largely just to prevent uh, dogs barking or children screaming or other extraneous sounds from creeping through. Um, we always invite people to say hello using the chat feature. And for the most part, if you have a question, you can ask it at any time. And we ask to use the chat for questions. As we do have a small group where we have questions, we can unmute and, and uh, pop in there at, at that point in time. Uh, I am going to, I think, take myself off the camera for now, just so I don't distract myself. Um, and there we go. So uh, we'll just introduce ourselves as uh, who is OCCA? What is the Otsego County Conservation Association? Uh, we are a private nonprofit organization that promotes the sustainable use and appreciation of Otsego County's natural resources through a variety of means. And I would say that education is part of everything that we do. Uh, we do pride ourselves as being science-based um, we've been in business here since 1968, and if you have participated in our programs or been a member or donor, we appreciate that. And if you haven't in the past, we would love it if you would. <laughs> okay, um, that's basically, we have a full-time staff of three, uh, one part permanent part-timer and various seasonal folks who come in and help us out, as well as volunteers who help us with a number of our programs. Okay. That did not move. Why is that not moving? Okay, there we go. Uh, and this is me. Uh, I was a wildlife science major in college who fell into uh, environmental education while I was in school, much as I fell into the marsh that I'm in in the picture. Uh, I've been with OCCA as an employee since 2013, uh, though my family moved up here in 2003, I guess, and we were pretty much involved with OCCA um, right from the get-go. Uh, I spent a lot of time this summer in swamps like this one, so uh, let's move on. Okay, so why this program? Why non-invasive species? Uh, just to backtrack really quickly, uh, since the pandemic hit and we started doing a lot of online programs, we have been doing pretty much a monthly series uh, on the spotlight on invasive species. Uh, previous programs have included the emerald ash borer, aquatic invasives to watch for, wild parsnip, Japanese knotweed, and not listed there is a summer summary of, of the activities that we did this summer on invasive species management and control. And there is a lengthy YouTube link at the bottom, which all of those programs, if you have missed them, are available for viewing those and other programs that we've been doing. But why this program is because we do get a lot of calls from people who say, I found this, is it invasive? Or when we're doing programs with people, they, <laughs> oh, excuse me, um, when we're doing programs with people, they'll look at something and say, is that invasive? Or I thought this was invasive. So we just kind of thought, let's focus on some of the non-invasives, things that people uh, may think are invasive and we'll do a little education, make people a little bit more aware. Uh, I debated this particular slide uh, just because I feel like I've done it over and over again, but it, for people who may be new to the program, uh, we'll just before we talk about non-invasives, we do need to make sure we understand what invasives are. And when you ask people what's an invasive species, they may not know the definition, but they tend to come up with phrases like overpopulate or take over an area. So, you know, much as our 1950s monster movies had, you know, aliens invading earth and, and taking over, um, that's what they think of as invasive species, something that's going to take over. And that can be true, but it's not always so cut and dried. Uh, the official working definition for invasive species right now uh, or that invasive species are organisms that are not native to the environment in question. So they come from some other place and their introduction causes or is likely to cause harm to the environment, the economy and or human health. So for a species to be considered invasive, it has to check off the first box of not native 
uh, and it has to check off any one of those other three. Okay, um, and then it would be considered an invasive. So um, for native species, native species will sometimes uh, create harm in a way, and in that case, they are typically referred to as nuisance species. So some of the things that we're talking about today may be considered a nuisance. So with that introduction, let's take a look. We're going to jump right into goldenrod. Uh, and I could probably spend an entire program talking about goldenrod because it is one of my favorite wildflowers. Um, the reason I think people consider goldenrod to be invasive is because it it sort of explodes um, in late summer and becomes very, very obvious. So if in this particular picture, uh, all of this gold color up on the hillside here is goldenrod and goldenrod and back here and under that tree and everything, right? It becomes very, very obvious. Okay. Um, in another shot just from outside of Cooperstown, pretty much everything from the road over here to the top of the hill here, and from the foreground all the way up past over the little hillside there, pretty much everything in there is goldenrod. Um, so it lives in often very obvious places. Uh, and when you look at a field like this, you say, gosh, that's all goldenrod. It's a monoculture. It's, it's taking over. It's invasive. Well, uh, not so. Okay. Um, goldenrod, uh, and here's a, an individual plant showing some of that beauty. Okay. Um, goldenrod, what we, it should actually probably be golden rods. Okay. We tend to talk about it as if it is one single plant, but actually, even when we look at a field like this, there are at least two species in that field, probably more. Okay. Um, so goldenrod refers to any of the plants that are in the genus Solidago. Worldwide, there are more than 100 species, probably closer to 150 or so. I believe there's 100 in the United States alone. Uh, and there are 12 species recorded in Otsego County by the New York uh, Flora Atlas that has been done. I think one of them is a non-native, the rest are native. Okay? So it is a native species. So, so therefore, by definition, it's not, not invasive. Okay. A few other things about the plant. We typically associate it with fields and roadsides as in the previous pictures, but there are woodland species that grow in the shade. Uh, there are also species that like dry areas and dry open sunny fields, and there are species that prefer wetland types of soils and will grow uh, more at the margins of swamps and marshes and such. So it, it really covers um, a lot of different environments, but our, our biggest association, I, I would say, with golden rods are of the uh, open field environments. It's a member of the aster family, uh, so it includes things like sunflowers, the asters, uh, many, many common plants uh, of that nature. The flower structure is very complex uh, and typical of asters is that uh, the seeds, which it's starting to go to seed now, uh, is a little seed with hairs on it that is very fluffy and will float in the air. And it's a perennial. Okay, so it comes back year after year. I, you know, I, th that's a plant that I tend to look at and think of that each year is fresh growth from seeds, but it is actually has a rhizome, um, sort of a horizontal root structure that it will form, which allows it to form dense colonies. So you'll get clusters of, <clears throat> excuse me, goldenrod that uh, come up in a single area, um, often from a single root. So it's sort of like a clone type of plant. Uh, so I'm going to apologize uh, for the photo on the left, which is almost clear, just blurry enough to kind of probably make you blink your eyes a bunch. Um, we were talking about different types of goldenrod. Um, both of these are from pretty much the same place at the top of my driveway, where I kind of let it run a little rampant. Uh, the photo on the left, you can see the leaf, I look at that as almost like a spearmint leaf in terms of texture and shape. Um, it's very rough to the touch. Uh, the stem is dark, almost going towards reddish and has hairs on it. The specimens on the right, you notice that the leaves are long and lance shaped. Uh, they're very smooth. Uh, I'm trying to think if there are actual hairs on the stem there, but the stem in this case is more green and pale. 
Um, and it, you know, again, very smooth. So two different species of goldenrod. I cannot remember which one is which. <laughs> so I didn't identify them. Goldenrods can be difficult to identify. Um, in the Newcomb's Wildflower Guide, it has its own section. So uh, because there are so many different kinds and, and because of the difficulties. Okay. Um, so again, different types of goldenrod growing in, in the same space. I was not able to get good pictures of some. Uh, most of them have this sort of flower structure, by the way, where you have the, the golden rod, um, where these flowers are arranged uh, on the tops of these little stems. Okay, there are some species that do develop almost like a flat topped cluster and some species where the flowers are actually in the leaf axles kind of running up and down the stem. And again, unfortunately, I don't have pictures of, of those types. Okay. Uh, but again, just to talk about some of the variety of goldenrod. Uh, one of the things I love about goldenrod is that it is a magnet for life. Um, this is one of my favorite insects. It's called a locust borer. It uh, grows and develops on locust trees. But in fall or late summer, you can find it feeding on goldenrod. Uh, goldenrod is uh, a, an important source of food uh, for many, many bees, wasps, flies, ants, aphids. Um, I'm trying to remember, there's, there's just tons of, of critters that, that use it. Uh, then you'll get the predators like spiders and ambush bugs hiding out in there as well. Um, so it, it just is, when you visit a little bit of goldenrod, it's buzzing with life. There's all kinds of things happening there. Uh, the foliage also tends to, to attract different sorts of insects, leaf miners, uh, gall making insects that lay eggs in the stems and, and create these uh, golf ball sizes. So, and, and this is one of the things when we look at invasive species, uh, a lot of the invasives, because they are unfamiliar to the environment, they do not have associations with native animals. So um, you look at something like Japanese knotweed, about the only thing I've ever seen eating Japanese knotweed or Japanese beetles. Um, it does get pollinated by various wasps and bees and things, but not to the level that you see with goldenrod. This, this is usually just just brimming and, and bustling with activity. And if you were to look in the, on the ground beneath the goldenrod, you will actually see native, other native plants growing in there in the shade and, and in the dense, denseness there. So it does not truly crowd out um, other types of plants. Uh, it is not harmful to the economy. It does not do harm to human health. Uh, one of the common uh, misconceptions about goldenrod is that it is a trigger for hay fever. Uh, this is not true. Uh, goldenrod pollen is actually kind of heavy and does not go airborne very well. What makes people sneeze and get itchy eyes in, in the late summer and fall is usually ragweed, which is a much less showy plant. Um, goldenrod is obvious. It's so, it's, so, it's so in your face, basically, that I think people just falsely ascribed the uh, uh, allergies to it. Okay. Uh, one of the other creatures, this is also on goldenrod, and I got really excited okay, uh, that, that we're going to highlight today on the non-invasives are box elder bugs. And here's my caveat. This is not a box elder bug. This is actually a milkweed bug. Uh, I, I found this crawling around on my goldenrod the other day, and it, it immediately made me say, oh, box elder bug. And I took a picture and I said, I'm going to do box elder bugs. And, and then I realized this was actually a milkweed bug. Um, but it, again, just shows that, you know, things living on here, okay? Um, this is a box elder bug, okay? Um, with some ladybugs in the background, okay? The box elder bug is a, up to an inch long, uh, black with these kind of reddish uh, margins on the leaves. That generally tells you something, that sort of coloration generally will tell you that something is kind of noxious. It's not good to eat. Okay. I wouldn't eat either of them anyway. Okay. Um, just some facts about the box elder bug is that they are of the order Hemiptera, which is true bugs. Okay. And uh, unlike the beetles in the background, ladybugs are, are a type of beetle. Hemiptera have, uh, all Hemiptera have piercing sucking mouth parts. So basically it's like a sharp tube that they will punch into their food um, and suck juices out. 
They have incomplete metamorphosis. So when they lay the eggs, the eggs will hatch into a sort of a miniature insect that looks kind of like the adult. Um, and they do not go into a cocoon or, or uh, pupil sort of stage. Okay. Um, and one of the ways you can recognize the uh, hemiptera is that the wings, when they fold across the back, leave sort of an X pattern. If you can follow my cursor, you see how this creates that sort of rough sort of X pattern across the back. Okay. Um, unlike a beetle, like the ladybug beetle, where their wing covers make a straight line down the back. So this is one of the ways you would recognize hemiptera, true bugs. Okay. These are native to North America. So these are found in across the United States, uh, primarily east of the Mississippi, but pretty much completely across the US. Um, I do understand they are becoming invasive in South America, in parts of South America now. Okay, so our species can be invasive elsewhere. Okay. Uh, the box elder bug, as the name suggests, feeds primarily on box elder trees. If you are not familiar with a box elder, it is a type of maple. Um, it does feed on other maples as well as ash trees, and it feeds primarily on seeds. So it will use that piercing, sucking mouth part to basically punch a hole in a seed case and feed on, uh, I guess, the starches and sugars that are contained inside. Okay. It is not generally considered to be a pest. Um, it does not damage any of the trees. It does not um, cause tree death or prevent uh, our box elders or other maples from reproducing. Okay. They're sometimes referred to as stink bugs. They are not a true stink bug. That is a different group, um, but they are kind of smelly. Like if you were to crush one, it would be kind of smelly. If you were to disturb one, it might give off a little bit of an odor. Okay. Um, that would be part of, of whatever makes them taste bad. And, and so they carry, again, they carry that sort of black and reddish, black and orange warning sign. Okay. But again, they are not, they are not true stink bugs. Uh, the reason they become something of a, a question about whether they are invasive or not is because of their behavior, uh, particularly towards the end of the summer, uh, box elder bugs will start to leave the forested areas and or the parks where they live. Uh, they'll start to gather up, particularly on cooler days in a sunny location where it's warm. Uh, so here we see a gathering of box elder bugs. And again, if you follow the cursor, most of these are adults. You can see that kind of dark body with the reddish kind of pattern along the, the back of the wings. These red ones here are actually the nymphs. These are younger, more immature forms of the insect. So they have a red abdomen and little black. These are developing wings. Okay. Um, so people get alarmed when, you know, if they go outside and it looks like this is a a bench or something like that. Uh, you know, they go get alarmed if they find a bunch of box elder bugs crawling all over their picnic table or on the side of a tree. Um, it's a little, it's a little unnerving. Uh, it's particularly unnerving if you are to come home at the end of the day and see something like this. Um, I hope, I hope you don't have the heebie-jeebies from insects. This could look like a bunch of roaches crawling on the side of the house, but these are all box elder bugs. So what's happening with box elder bugs at this time of year is the adults are looking to overwinter. Uh, in the wild, they would overwinter in a crevice in a tree or a hollowed out piece of a, you know, part of a tree or beneath loose bark on the side of a tree, maybe underneath some rocks, uh, but they will also go to houses. And again, you have a nice sunny, warm location. They're sitting on that nice white surface getting warm. And what you see up here is where the siding kind of meets the foundation. You might have cracks in the box elder bugs when they're seeking their shelter for the winter might squeeze into those cracks. Okay. Um, they do not do any harm to, to your home. It's not like a carpenter ant that is going to tunnel into the, your posts and your beams and and uh, such and cause structural damage. Um, they're not going to harm you because they are not biters. They will not, you know, seek you out and bite you in your sleep or anything like that. Um, but what can happen is they can, once they're inside the walls of the home, they, when it, when springtime comes again, they may find their way into your house um, in large numbers. And that would be a definite nuisance. Um, 
And again, if you're trying to move them or remove them, they might smell a little bit if you crush them. Um, and they can also cause some staining on furniture, floors, or walls as a result of their droppings. Um, so non-invasive, but definitely on the nuisance side of things. Okay, any questions so far? All right, we shall move on. Uh, what do I have next? Ah, dandelions. Okay. And I know you're saying, wait a minute, Jeff, uh, dandelions are definitely invasive. And if you look at that picture, that is uh, from somewhere out west, I think, probably Utah. Um, you see a large, large field absolutely covered in dandelions. So look at that, it's taking over. Um, it, they're, they're not native, they're, they're definitely invasives. Um, and you are correct that they are not native. Dandelions are native to Europe and parts of Asia, uh, but they are what would be said to be naturalized. They have established themselves at this point in all 50 states, and I believe all of the Canadian provinces, um, they are pretty much a worldwide plant at this point. Um, however, they are not currently categorized by either the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation or the, um, oh gosh, the federal agencies, I'm trying to remember which one, they are not classified as invasive species. Okay. By and large, they do not do economic harm. And they are not really, just despite how it looks in that photograph, they are not really um, an economic threat. Um, okay. uh, they don't alter the environment all that much. Okay. Uh, these are uh, just some other notes on dandelions is that they are perennial. So again, like our goldenrod, we think of, uh, you know, you kind of think of it as a year to year thing, but uh, they have a taproot that uh, can sprout new plants each year for many, many years. Okay. Each plant can produce thousands of seeds per year. I've seen anywhere from three to 20 thousand seeds per year. So you look at that field, for example, and there must be tens of thousands of dandelion flowers out there. And if they are each producing, you know, 3,000 uh, seeds, that is a lot of seeds to scatter. And those seeds can fly for miles and miles before finding a, a place to land and potentially germinating. Um, it has been generally a useful plant uh, used in different medicines, used for dandelion wine, of course, um, and also as food for salad greens. I think that the root is edible. I think I've had no people who have eaten the flowers as well. Um, it is a bitter type of herb. It has latex types of substances in it uh, that does make it bitter, but it is not dangerous to people. It is not dangerous to livestock. It's, it's a uh, more, than harm, it, more than harmless. It's, it's, it's generally helpful. Okay. Um, and like our goldenrod, it is also in the aster family. Okay. Um, and it's quite pretty to look at. Um, it's a very complex sort of flower made up of many, many repeating parts. Um, and again, while it is alien, uh, it, it has established itself. Um, it's generally believed that dandelions were brought over by the Puritans and other early settlers uh, because A, it was a useful plant for them, uh, and B, it kind of reminded them of home. You know, it was a little piece of home to bring, to bring with them and, and plant. Um, and it's spread quite, uh, quite by accident. Okay. Um, and again, when you look at this sort of situation, you, you kind of say that this could be considered a nuisance. You know, if this is your lawn, this is, <laughs> this is a nuisance, um, but it is not damaging to the environment um, and it is not particularly damaging to the economy. Okay, and I want to mention, uh, kind of finishing up on the, the dandelion portion here, um, Ward Stone was a uh, uh, the pathologist for New York State for many, many years, and I saw him uh, present at a conference some years ago, and uh, he was very much against poisons and uh, a lot of the things that we were doing to the environment, and uh, 
as the state wildlife pathologist, he saw the results of a lot of our activities would come across, you know, when people would send dead birds or dead animals and, and he would autopsy them. But he apparently called one of his uh, local cooperative extensions once without identifying himself. And he asked the person what the best way was to remove dandelions. And he was recommended a variety of herbicides to use. And so Stone then asked for alternatives. Uh, and the recommendation was using a handheld flamethrower to burn them out, <laughs> which seems pretty crazy. Um, when Stone continued to ask him about other alternatives, because you know setting fire to your lawn doesn't seem like a great idea, uh, he was told you could dig them out with a shovel, uh, but as it's labor intensive, the best thing to do would be to just use herbicides. Stone finally asked him, why should I bother removing dandelions? And after a long pause, the person said, they cause brown spots. <laughs> and so Stone used that as a, you know, a crusade against herbicides and things, but it's, a, it's an attractive plant. Um, I mean, look at that. Look at the structure of that seed head there. And, uh, you know, really it does no harm. You know, we have, we have uh, created this ideal of what a suburban lawn looks like. Um, and it doesn't include dandelions, but uh, you know they're really an interesting plant. And you know, again, not native, not invasive, though definitely qualifying as a nuisance. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we move on? All right. Uh, we're going to come up on webworms and tent caterpillars. So this is. Again, like our bugs, not for the squeamish. Okay, um, and you know we do start getting questions about these things. Uh, what are webworms? What are tent caterpillars? These are native. Okay, um, and when we talk about webworms and tent caterpillars, we're talking about three species from two different families of moths. Uh, they feed on a variety of trees, but tend to prefer hardwoods. Uh, a slight difference, tent caterpillars do tend to go for things like cherries, birches, and oaks a little bit more, um, whereas the webworms will often feed on more fruit types of trees, but, but they have a pretty varied diet. They can be destructive, okay? They can be destructive, uh, but that destruction is usually more on an individual tree level than it is on a landscape level. So uh, first we'll cover tent caterpillars. Uh, this is a, a typical site that you see of a tent caterpillar. Um, now they are active late spring through early summer. And if you notice in this particular photo, uh, the, the, the tree that they're building their tent on uh, has not leafed out yet, right? There are still some buds on this tree that have not burst and the photo that the, the uh, trees in the background are just starting to leaf out. So you figure, late April, early May, depending on uh, whether we have a good spring or not, uh, is when you'll start to see this, okay? Um, they build a tent made of caterpillar silk. Uh, the tent caterpillars will typically build in this sort of location, which is along the trunk uh, where the branches are forking out, okay? Um, also, some species, the, the eastern forest, the forest tent caterpillar, excuse me, instead of building a big tent like this, will actually build sort of a sheet on the tree trunk and use that as sort of their base of operations. Okay. So they'll build this tent or this mat or sheet. Uh, the larva, that's the caterpillars, will basically leave this tent every day and feed outside of the tent. So they'll go out to the end of the branches and they'll start to feed on those tender young leaves. And then at the end of the day, they return to the tent uh, for, to, for the night, okay? Now, what happens with these creatures is that periodically they are prone to uh, a, a mass population spike. And during those years, they can cause large scale defoliation, okay? But generally speaking, a single tent like this one, if it's, it, it will not necessarily defoliate the entire tree, okay? It can. Okay, but, it, but the, again, this is more of a, of a tragedy on a tree by tree level as opposed to, a, you know, the defoliation of an entire forest. But again, at certain years, uh, you will have a population spike that will, will cause, you know, a pretty ugly scene. Okay, now the good news is because these caterpillars feed early in the season, they're gone by late June. 
uh, trees typically have an opportunity to leaf out a second time. So um, they will be a little weakened. They may be more susceptible to other um, pathogens, but typically for one or two year, a, a, a tree can survive one or two years of defoliation. If you get into three years running, then, then it's going to become weak and probably will die. Uh, these are what tent caterpillars look like. These are two, the two different species. The one on the right is the eastern tent caterpillar. They look pretty similar. The one on the left is the forest tent caterpillar. The eastern tent caterpillar has this kind of straight yellowy line right down the back and spots down the side. Uh, our forest tent caterpillar has kind of blue lines down the side and what they call keyhole or footprint type of uh, shape running right down the middle of the back. And again, both species will be, these two species will be active at the same time of year, okay? Spring, late spring to early summer, okay? And this is what the adult moth will look like. It's, you know, kind of a generic white moth, um, hard to tell from many other moths. Okay, fall webworm on the other hand uh, is, is a totally different species species in a different family group. Uh, these are active in late summer to early fall. So if you notice this photo here, this was, when did I take this? I think I took this at the beginning of August. You notice that the tree in question is fully foliaged, um, you know, nice dense foliage. Uh, this is midsummer. Okay, so the tent caterpillars disappear, the fall webworms start to show up. So unfortunately, if a tree happens to get hit with, uh, with tent caterpillars and then gets hit with um, webworms. Okay. Now, the other differences are that the tents for fall webworms are located at the ends of the branches, right? They kind of wrap up these uh, leaves down at the end. The larva, the caterpillars will feed inside of the tent. So they'll stay inside the tent the whole time. And, you know, <laughs> This is an interesting looking thing because right now on this particular web, it's very white uh, in color, but as these things get older, they tend to get kind of brown and, and dingy looking. Um, you know, you can kind of see this massive wrapped up brown leaves in there. They get full of brown leaves. They get full of caterpillar poop. It's really, uh, really kind of ugly. Okay. Um, and again, like our tent caterpillars, the damage is typically to an individual tree, um, and these are rarely on a landscape level. Okay? Um, they can be a nuisance. They can be a nuisance to ornamental trees, um, and if you are a, you know, if you have an orchard for fruit, um, they can be a problem there. But by and large, you know, it's 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 again, it's more about this one tree that has suffered as opposed to. Um, you know, defoliating an entire forest or an entire orchard. Okay, this is late season here. So this was early September over in Hartwick, I wanna say. Um, so this is a case of a tree, a smaller tree that has really been severely impacted by webworms. And you can see how much, how dingy this looks in comparison. Uh, this year was a big year, seems to be a big year for the fall webworms. We saw a lot of them. Um, uh, you know, for not entirely sure what conditions, uh, you know, make them more prone to, to having big years or not, you know, versus um, there is some question of whether changes in climate are going to affect them and increase their activity period. Um, but again, usually these things are, you know, you'll start to see them in July and then, you know, by now they're pretty much done. Okay. Uh, this is what the individual caterpillar looks like. So unlike that dark caterpillar with the yellow line down the back, this one is a little more yellowy. There's a lot of color variation in there. Um, some of them are a little bit reddish. Some of them are more yellow like this. Um, all of them are particularly bristly. This is a, a very bristly sort of caterpillar. Okay. And here's the adult. Um, again, sort of, actually that's a pretty attractive uh, kind of moth there with that, that sort of speckling color. Uh, let's see, do we have any questions before we move on to sneak preview water lilies? Uh, 
Okay. Uh, so we're going to talk about water lilies, um, which, you know, again, this is a, uh, you know, we do a lot of invasive species work out on lakes and ponds here. And invariably we get people asking about water lilies. Are these things not, are these things native? Um, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Let's see. Well, first of all, we'll cover what they are. Um, water lilies that we're referring to today come from one large grouping of plants. Uh, they typically are floating leaved or emergent. So the leaves are either floating right on the surface of the water or sometimes they're held a little bit above the water. When you look at the leaves, one of the things that will distinguish them from some of the other floating types of plants is that the stem attaches on the underside of the leaf in the center of the leaf. Okay, not at the back end, you know, like, like we tend to think of as a, you know, a maple leaf on a tree, you know, on a tree or something. Okay, they typically have large showy flowers such as this one. Um, and they have a root system that is rhizomes. This is one of the things that helps them spread. It's a, uh, a, a thick root um, that will sometimes branch, um, have multiple branches on it that new plants will grow up from. Also, if you are disturbing the sediments or you know you have activity from waterfowl or muskrats or beavers, they might be dislodging pieces of those rhizomes and having them float to other places and um, helping to spread um, the uh, lilies to other parts of the pond or other water bodies. Okay. Uh, and again, there's several species that we're talking that we'll be talking about here today. Okay, so I think that this is again one of the reasons why people look at this and say these are these are uh, invasives. You look at a lake like this one, and you know, I'll, most of the vegetation that you're seeing in this photo are one of two species of water lilies. Okay, um, they are they can be a nuisance. So um, in this particular lake, the the locals were saying that. Um, you know, there's more of them than there used to be. And I think the water levels uh, either rose or fell a little bit and created better conditions for the plants. Um, likely also that there's more nutrients in the water from, from development around this particular lake um, contributing to, to plant growth. Uh, they're a nuisance again because they can interfere with fishing, they can interfere with boating, they can interfere with swimming, uh, but it is not invasive. Um, it is not, they are not considered invasive because they are native plants um, and because they really don't fundamentally alter the economy or the environment in question and they're not harmful to human health. So we'll look at two different species. One is the white water lily. Um, I think part of what gets people about this species and makes them think it's invasive is that it has an exotic look uh, about it. You know, we think of Monet's water lilies paintings that's very European or that uh, the, the lotus flower is, you know, something that is, is seen as very important in many of the Eastern cultures. And, and so when we see this on our own lakes, I think people say, oh, that can't be from here because I've seen it on all these famous paintings and things. Okay. But again, the white water lily is a native to North America. It's also known as the fragrant water lily. Um, and this is native, it will flower throughout the summer. So it's, it's, it's pretty much always in bloom. Okay. Um, in terms of recognizing it, it's got this very large leaf, uh, very round, oval to round in shape, but typically more round. Okay. And it's dissected uh, down one side. Uh, the stem would be right about under here where my cursor is, uh, where it would attach. Um, I always tell people it looks sort of like a Pac-Man. Um, it's kind of straight edged where that dissection is. All right. Um, and again, very, very large leaf up to, you know, what about a foot across or so. Okay. Um, let me just see if there's anything else I want to say about that particular one. So yeah, uh, like a Pac-Man. Okay. The other species that will confuse people is something known as spatterdock or yellow pond lily, or I think it's also known as cow lily. It's got multiple names. Um, this one has this kind of yellow uh, uh, 
yellow flower that's a little less showy. It's it's quite nice, um, but but definitely a, a different look. It almost has a waxy look to it. Uh, from the side, you know, I kind of say you can recognize it before it's opened in particular, it'll sort of look like a golf ball on a tee. Um, but this is, in this case, we see that the flower itself is emergent, whereas on our white water lily, it tends to be floating on the surface. Okay. Um, now the leaves, and I don't have a good picture of the spatter dock leaves, unfortunately. Um, so I, I, my eye keeps going to the water chestnut right in the middle of this picture. <laughs> I can't help it. Um, so here's the water chestnut, which is definitely invasive. This, these two leaves right here, actually these four, are Pac-Mans. These are our white water lily leaves. And the spatter dock leaves are these ones that are not quite centered up at the very top of the photo and down at the bottom. And the leaves on the spatter dock tend to be much more um, oblong. Uh, they can look almost football shaped with, in this case, the, the dissection in the leaf is kind of curving. Okay, and let me go back for a second to this picture too, because you can kind of see it's how it, it, it spreads, but it's a, a curving sort of shape. So it's not as, you know, not as Pac-Man shaped as our white water lilies and definitely a much longer, broader uh, sort of leaf. Okay. Um, and again, these are, these are native species, um, but because they are so common, because they are seen in such large numbers on our lakes, I think a lot of times people confuse them uh, with something that is invasive. Okay. Oh, I did leave this one in. Um, I almost took this one out because this is a plant that I, I've only really seen for the first time this year. This is water shield, um, which is actually in a different family from the previous two uh, plants. It's, it's not a true water lily, uh, but it has some of those same characteristics. In this case, this one has a football shaped leaf. It's pretty small, maybe three to four inches across the widest part. The root uh, the root. The stem affixes right in the middle of that leaf um, and it does root into the sediments. But as I said, I've only seen this in, in one lake. It is native to the area, but it doesn't seem to be quite as common. But if you if you find this, like I know Trish, you uh, up in Crumhorn Lake, I don't know if you see this there or not. Um, this is also doesn't have the big showy flower. I didn't get a picture of the flower this year. Um, but it, it, it's a small kind of reddish pink flower that's held above the water line. The water shield, by the way, if you turn over the leaf and feel the underside, it's really, really slimy, kind of kind of gross in a way. Um, there are no slits or, or dissections in this particular type of leaf. These obviously are, look like they've been eaten by things, um, small critters that are eating them, so. Uh, let's see, do I, did I add anybody else? I think that was how I was going to end this. Um, I appreciate your time today. Uh, we do have a couple of programs that are coming up on Friday morning. We are hitting the links. We are not golfing, but we are walking on the leather stocking golf course uh, from eight to about 10 a.m. with the course superintendent who tell us about his court, the golf course and, and uh, management procedures, environmentally friendly management procedures. Uh, on October 21st, we have planning for a changing climate. This is a webinar with Danny Lappin, our planner at 5.30 p.m. October 24th, uh, Saturday morning, we are doing a highway cleanup up in Springfield along Route 80. Uh, would love some help for that. And then I forgot to mention, I forgot to add, this was November 4th. We'll be doing a, a webinar for the Upper Susquehanna Coalition's Watershed Wednesdays program on hand removal of invasive aquatic invasive species. Um, uh, uh, again, thank you all for coming. And if anybody has any questions, please ask away.